Chapter Thirteen of The Life of Benjamin Franklin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Benjamin Franklin by Samuel G. Goodrich. Chapter Thirteen. Congress at Albany. Plan for a Union of the Colonies. Arrival of General Braddock. Franklin sent to him by the Assembly. Want of wagons. Franklin undertakes to procure them. His advertisement. Anecdote of Braddock. Battle with the Indians. Retreat. In 1754 there was again a prospect of war with France. A congress of commissioners from the different colonies was ordered to be assembled at Albany to confer with the chiefs of the six nations of Indians in respect to the defense of the country. The governor of Pennsylvania communicated this order to the assembly and nominated Franklin with Mr. Norris, Mr. Penn, and Mr. Peters to act as commissioners. Presents were provided for the Indians, and they all met at Albany about the middle of June. On his way thither, Franklin projected and drew up a plan for the union of all the colonies under one government, so far as might be necessary for defense and other important services. This plan was shown to two or three of his friends, and, having met with their approbation, was submitted to Congress. It then appeared that several of the commissioners had formed projects of the same kind. A committee was appointed to consider the several plans and report. That promised by Franklin was finally adopted with a few alterations. Copies of it were sent to the British government and to the assemblies of the several provinces. The British government was unwilling to permit the Union proposed at Albany from a fear that the colonies would become too military and feel their own strength. They accordingly sent over General Braddock with two regiments of regular English troops for the purpose of protecting them. This officer, with his forces, landed at Alexandria and marched there to Fredericktown in Maryland, where he halted for carriages. Franklin was sent by the assembly to wait upon him at this place in order to arrange some matters which had occurred to excite serious misunderstanding. His son accompanied him upon this journey. They found the general at Fredericktown waiting impatiently for the return of those whom he had sent through the back parts of Maryland and Virginia to collect wagons. Franklin stayed with him for several days, dined with him daily, and had full opportunity of removing his prejudices. When he was about to depart, it had been ascertained that only twenty-five wagons could be procured, and not all of them fit for use. The general and all the officers were very much surprised, and declared that the expedition was entirely at an end. They exclaimed bitterly against their government for sending them into a country destitute of the means of carrying their stores and baggage, for which no less than one hundred and fifty wagons were necessary. Franklin remarked that it was a pity they had not been landed in Pennsylvania, as in that country almost every farmer had his wagon. The general caught at his words and eagerly said, "'Then you, sir, who are a man of interest there, can possibly procure them for us, and I beg you will undertake it.' Franklin accepted what terms were to be offered to the owners of the wagons, and he was desired to put on paper the terms that appeared to him necessary. This he did, and they were accepted. He soon after published an advertisement offering to contract for certain wagons and horses on specified terms, and to this added an address to the inhabitants of the counties of York, Lancaster, and Cumberland. The address was in the following words. Friends and Countrymen, being occasionally at the camp at Frederick a few days since, I found the general and officers exceedingly exasperated on account of their not being supplied with horses and carriages, which had been expected from this province, as most able to furnish them. But, through the dissensions between our governor and assembly, money had not been provided, nor any steps taken for that purpose. It was proposed to send an armed force immediately into these counties to seize as many of the best carriages and horses as should be wanted, and compel as many persons into the service as would be necessary to drive and take care of them. If you are really, as I believe you are, good and loyal subjects to His Majesty, you may now do a most acceptable service and make it easy for yourselves, for three or four of such as cannot separately spare, from the business of their plantations, a wagon and four horses and a driver, may do it together, one furnishing the wagon, another one or two horses, and another the driver, and divide the pay proportionally between you. 
but if you do not this service to your king and country voluntarily when such good pay and reasonable terms are offered to you your loyalty will be strongly suspected the king's business must be done so many brave troops come so far for your defence must not stand idle through your backwardness to do what may be reasonably expected from you wagons and horses must be had violent measures will probably be used and you will be left to seek recompense where you can find it and your case perhaps be little pitied or regarded i have no particular interest in this affair as except the satisfaction of endeavouring to do good i shall have only my labour for my pains if this method of obtaining the wagons and the horses is not likely to succeed i am obliged to send word to the general in fourteen days and i suppose sir john st clair the hussar with a body of soldiers will immediately enter the province for the purpose which i shall be very sorry to hear because i am very sincerely and truly your friend and well-wisher benjamin franklin eight hundred pounds were furnished by the general to be paid out as advance money to the owners of the wagons and horses this sum not being large enough franklin advanced upwards of two hundred pounds more in two weeks the one hundred and fifty wagons with two hundred and fifty nine carrying horses were on their way to the camp the advertisement promised payment in case any wagon or horse should be lost as the owners knew nothing about the dependence to be placed on general braddock they insisted on franklin's bond for the performance this he accordingly gave them general braddock was a brave man but had too much self-confidence too high an opinion of the power of regular troops and too mean an idea of both americans and indians about one hundred indians joined him on his march who might have been of great use to him as guides and scouts if he had treated them kindly he neglected and slighted them however and they gradually left him in conversation one day with franklin he gave an account of his intended progress after taking fort duquesne said he i am to proceed to niagara and having taken that to frontenac if the season will allow time and i suppose it will for duquesne can hardly detain me above three or four days and then i see nothing that can obstruct my march to niagara franklin knew something about marches through the woods and the tricks of the indians and entertained serious doubts in respect to the success of the campaign he only ventured however to say to be sure sir if you arrive well before duquesne with the fine troops so well provided with artillery the fort though completely fortified and assisted with a very strong garrison can probably make but a short resistance the only danger i apprehend for obstruction to your march is from the ambuscades of the indians who by constant practice are dexterous in laying and executing them and the slender line nearly four miles long which your army must make may expose it to be attacked by surprise in its flanks and to be cut like a thread into several pieces which from their distance cannot come up in time to support each other braddock smiled at his ignorance and replied these savages may indeed be a formidable enemy to your raw american militia but upon the king's regular and disciplined troops sir it is impossible they should make any impression the enemy did not take that advantage of the army under braddock which franklin anticipated they suffered it to approach without interruption till within nine miles of fort duquesne the troops had just crossed a river were in a more open part of the woods than any they passed and moving forward in a compact form their advanced guard was suddenly attacked by a heavy fire from behind trees and bushes this was the first intelligence which the general had of the approach of an enemy the guard became disordered the general hurried his troops up to their assistance this was done in great confusion through wagons baggage and cattle they were now attacked also from behind the officers were on horseback and easily distinguished and picked out as marks by the enemy the soldiers were thrown together in great disorder having or hearing no orders and standing to be shot at all till two-thirds of them were killed then being seized with a panic the remainder fled in precipitation the wagoners took each a horse out of his team and scampered their example was immediately followed by others so that all the wagons provisions artillery and stores were left to the enemy the general being wounded was brought off with difficulty out of eighty-six officers sixty-three were killed or wounded and seven hundred and forty men were killed of eleven hundred these men had been picked from the whole army the rest had been left behind with colonel dunbar who was to follow with the heavier parts of the baggage 
the fugitives arrived at dunbar's camps and communicated their own panic to him and all his people though he had now above a thousand men he determined not to meddle with the enemy but to make the best of his way to the settlements notwithstanding requests from the governor of virginia maryland and pennsylvania that he would post his troops on the frontiers to protect the inhabitants he continued his hasty and disgraceful march till he had arrived at snug quarters in philadelphia End of chapter thirteen